This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Such a cool old song, right? From Simon and Garfunkel. And that lyric, In the clearing stands a boxer and a fighter by his trade. And he carries the reminders of every glove that laid him down or cut him till he cried out in his anger and his shame. I'm leaving, I'm leaving, but the fighter still remains. And I think that's an appropriate attitude for our little blue planet in 2012. But the fighter still remains. I don't know about you, but this fighter, I'm always going to have, I'm always going to be ready to throw a punch, verbally or physically, frankly. Whether I win or lose, I really don't care. But you got to have the fight in you. You know, if you're just sitting there right now and you're sitting on the couch and you've kind of like become one with the couch, you're a piece of the couch and the Domino's guy's coming in and you're watching Kardashian show and you feel like you're really at the top of the heap. Oh, come on, man. Get up. Get up. You're sitting around waiting for the politician. What was the tweet that I put this weekend up? I said, how did it reach the point that millions upon millions of people actually believe that the selection of a politician will fix their personal and economic lives. They think this could all happen via a vote. How do we reach that point? But, so I love that uh, Simon and Garfunkel song, The Boxer, the inspirational aspect. And it's a personal fight. It's personal responsibility. All that other stuff, eh, it's just a waste of time. It's just noise. I want to take a quick moment to remind listeners out there that I'm not just about podcasts. My firm has been teaching would-be trend-following traders for over a decade. I have thousands of students in 70-plus countries. The testimonials, they're all there. My training is for those that need the hand-holding, the in-person support to understand what is a good trend-following system And can you provide me one? Yes, we can is the answer there. And can there be some training along the way? My firm handles all of these issues for students. If you want to be a trend following trader, if you need systems, and if you need training, my firm can help you. Go to www.trendfollowing.com. Let's jump right back into the podcast. So today I want to talk about losses, such a fun topic. Uh, It should be a fun topic. It should be a fan. The topic of losses, if you trade, if you want to make money, should be at the top of your list. I've had this conversation long with Larry Height, and he he's he's thought of book titles that like the loser's guide to winning and always talking about it from a loss perspective. It's not sexy. I'll grant you. You hear the word loss and most people want to run. Most people want to hear instant profits, millions, et cetera. That's why there's so many people standing in line to buy lottery tickets each day. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. Okay, but you know what? That's not the right way to do it. You're only here listening if you want a piece of advice or some type of insight or inspiration on the appropriate way to approach it. So as I talk about losses today, a couple different ways that I want to approach it. And uh, first off, this great image that I found of a, uh, a meat cleaver and a cutting board. And I put it on my blog so you can check it out. But imagine like a, uh, a stack of six, uh, meh, what is it, three by six note cards and the word losses, you know, written across the top of the note cards. And the cleaver is just smacked down into the cutting board and the stack of cards is cut in half. So the word losses is cut in half. No words. It just says, you know, losses and it's cut in half and there's the cleaver and you clearly know what it's saying. Cut your losses. And um, just great imagery. And I think before I even get into more detailed aspects of losses in terms of trading and 
sunk costs and opportunity costs. I want to use a, an example that someone sent me, uh, just a reader, and he said he had been reading Joe Montana's book, The Winning Spirit, and uh, it it resonated with him with also reading my stuff and listening to my stuff. And he goes on. He actually sent me some of the excerpts um, that I want to kind of uh, read here real quick. And here's the first excerpt. And this is, I guess, this is Joe Montana's words. In training for success, we shouldn't hide from failure. Just like football players in the film room, we study failure. We want to see how it happens and which strategies work to keep us from making the same mistakes again. The speed with which we shift from that place of understanding or failure to a place of confidence and achievement is crucial to achieving our own level of greatness. Great quote. Great, great, great quote. He's got another one. In sports, all champions and championship teams lose from time to time. The lesson is that losing is not a permanent defeat, but something from which they can profit. Athletes are taught more than most people how to learn from their mistakes, knowing they will soon be back competing in the same activity where they may have lost the day before. I, it's been a long time, but I think back to playing baseball, and uh, baseball, you know, if you, you come up to the plate to hit 10 times and you get a hit three times, you, you might go to the Hall of Fame. You know, three and a half times, you definitely go in the Hall of Fame. So you, you know you can't hit it every time. You know it's not going to happen every at bat. But you go through this process of knowing seven losers, three winners. The winners pay for the losers. And sports is a great analogy, as, as Montana is saying in his book. I mean, it's, uh, it's a perfect connection. You, having that emotional and uh, intestinal fortitude to stick with it in the face of loss. Now, I'll grant you, most a lot of people don't like that. They get completely bent out of shape, and uh, you know sometimes you, you you talk about people they have losses, and I don't. I look, the loss could be anything before I even get into trading. The loss could be a relationship. The loss could be a business. The loss could be a family member. It can be anything. And what happens is people don't know when to throw in the towel. They don't know when to quit. When do you get out? When do you get out? I mean, I've probably made that mistake the most in relationships. Probably the most in relationships, personal and, and business. When do you know when to get out? The quicker, the better. Because if you can literally treat human relationships uh, like your, your trading account, you can be better. Now, look, there are clearly you can't be that cutthroat. You have to look ahead. But when you're when you're looking at a personal relationship, if if you have analyzed that person and you know something about their background and you and you've given them all the time in the world and they can't adjust, they can't change, and all they're doing is bringing you down, so it's a loss for you. You have to get out. You have to move on because what happens is the loss. Um, prevents you from moving to the next opportunity. So you get stuck, and you're you're. You know this this applies to this applies to making money and happiness both. And there's a lot of unconscious psychological issues going on. In the in the notion of of holding on and being unable to take a loss, being unable to walk away from something. Let me give the example, and I've probably mentioned it before, but I did go to an MBA program and at Florida State University, I still remember there uh, walking in the first day. I remember a bunch of people in blue blazers with three gold buttons in a nice southern city, and I remember them looking at me, and I probably looked like a serial killer um, in terms of my appearance at the time. I, I don't really want to describe it too heavy, but let's just say the hair was a little bit longer and I probably looked a little rough. They probably thought I had wandered in from the, uh, from I don't know, from from some <laughs> some place that wasn't supposed to be in the nice MBA classroom. And I remember that first day, they were all just like, you know, where are you going to work? Where are you going to work? I was like, I oh, know, I'm just going to start. This is long before I was thinking about trading. I'm just going to start a business. And, anyways, that's kind of a side note about the whole MBA mentality of the types that show up. Of clearly there's exceptions to the rule. But when I think back to my MBA program, there was two things that I learned, and this was really before I was even thinking about trading. 
And it was the definition of a sunk cost and the definition of an opportunity cost. Uh, I guess also time value of money was kind of, uh, I was not an undergrad business uh, major. So, but speaking of sunk cost, real simple. Uh, if you buy something uh, and you, you know, you're not going to return it, you've spent the money, it's done. It's gone. If it turns out to be useless, you can't fret about it. You can't worry about it. It's over. It's gone. You spent the money. You don't get the money back. You literally have to wipe, the, wipe that slate clean, wipe your mind clean. You have spent the money. It is gone. You cannot get it back. So why worry about it? Why worry about it? Definition of a sunk cost. Who doesn't know somebody, maybe yourself, who spends most of their life tied up and worrying about sunk cost? I mean, investors do it all the time. People do it with personal relationships all the time. So I'm not going to belabor it. Sunk cost. That's it. You spent the money. You spent the time. It's gone. You can't get it back. Yesterday don't matter if it's gone. Opportunity cost. Real simple. If you are doing A, you can't do B. So it's a choice. If you invest your time, energy, et cetera, in this relationship or this person or this business opportunity, you can't invest it in these over here. And there is a cost to choosing one opportunity over another. You might not think there's a cost. You might not want to imagine that there is a cost. You might want to pretend that this comparison doesn't really exist. The one that I'm talking about, comparing opportunities, comparing, comparing the current opportunity you've selected to the one that you might not have even imagined is a cost. There's a price to doing it. Right now, my opportunity cost is, uh, I guess I could, when I finish this, I'm going for a run, but my opportunity cost is, in the, in the very short immediate of right now, um, I could be going for a run right now instead of speaking. So they're just compare those kinds of comparisons, very important. If you wake up at 22 years of age with your big old college degree, and you enter the labor force and you go to work for the United States government in some capacity and they give you a desk and they give you a title and they start talking about sick leave and retirement benefits and all these other little goodies and you're 22 years of age and you're going to go from GS this to GS that to SES and all these kind of other government labels that move you up the chain and eventually Shoot, by the time you're 25, you will have your life planned out. You will know exactly how much you get when you retire. You will know exactly how much your sick leave is. You'll be getting those little pay stubs. Everything's guaranteed. Life is a bowl of cherries. Now, what's the opportunity cost? The opportunity cost is you could go trade an account. You could go paint a picture. You could go sing a song. These are costs. You, you have to analyze these. Let me talk about some specifics in terms of, um, actually, I want to read one more quote because I think this is, uh, you know, when you, when you when you talk about sunk costs, the, if you can think about also, think about the companies that uh, succeed and fail. And just look at, look at, for example, let's compare Microsoft and Apple over the last 30 years. I remember in the early 1990s, the Microsoft groupies, I mean, they were just like, oh, Microsoft, Microsoft. And I kept thinking to myself, well, what's that? What's unique about Microsoft other than they are putting an operating system on every computer and they're giving you a product to use that allows you to write letters called Microsoft Word and Excel spreadsheet. So that was what they were giving you. Now, as a first mover and with the entire world's population needing these basic tools for the first time, it wasn't surprising that Microsoft accumulated massive amounts of cash. I think they were probably the highest market cap at one point in time. Um, but they didn't adjust. They, they saw what they had spent on building what they had built, and they didn't look at the opportunity cost. Whereas almost everything that Apple built, Microsoft could have owned. In fact, 
Apple today would not exist if Bill Gates did not make an investment in Apple in the early 1990s when Steve Jobs came back. And Jobs got Gates to create a, a new version of Office for the Mac. And Microsoft took a, a stake in Apple, a small stake at the time. So it's interesting where Microsoft just said, well, we've got these sunk costs and what we're doing, we're not gonna, we're not gonna break away from this. And, and their opportunity cost really was Apple. And, and I don't think it's really that hard to imagine the progression that Apple has gone in, especially if you were Bill Gates. I mean, do you really think that Bill Gates did not look or did not see a prototype of almost every type of device that Apple put out in the public? I mean, they're not going to tell you this, but do you really think that, that, that they weren't imagining what could happen with Apple? Billions upon billions of excess capital and a consumer electronics company, essentially Microsoft in the early 1990s. You really think they weren't imagining these things? They just didn't want to do it. They didn't execute. They couldn't figure it out. They could not imagine the opportunity cost. And I want to read this quote. I think this just will add about uh, uh, describes how people often have a hard time letting bygones be bygones. The bygones are bygones principle extends well beyond economics and is often ignored in poker, in war, and perhaps in love. Because you've invested heavily in a poker hand, a battle, or a courtship does not mean you should stick with it if the prospects of winning become very small. At every moment of decision, you should be concerned with how benefits from this time forward compare with current and future costs. That's just great. Now, from a trading perspective, you, you, you buy, you buy Apple today. No system, you just buy Apple today. Just have a stop loss. What do I mean? You buy Apple today, say you're willing to lose a certain amount of money and you're going to get out. That's it. Now, there's, uh, there's, let's just think about some of the negative reasons why people might not uh, uh, like stop losses. I can't reconcile myself to do it. Meaning, you know, you, you, I can't actually stick with my system. It says get out. Get out and take the loss. But you can't do it. You know, your first loss is your best loss in trading or relationships or whatnot. If you don't get out now, you're probably going to incur greater losses in the future. You got to figure out a way to reconcile it now. Know when you are going to get out before you get in. That's the trick. So some people say, well, the stock price or the market price, futures price, whatever, will rise once I cut the loss. Well, it might. Maybe you have to get back in. You don't know. You can't predict. How, ca how can you know? That's why having a system that says, I will get out, I will come back to play another day. You don't have unlimited capital. I don't care whether you're Boone Pickens or John Henry, uh, you know, Bruce Cobner, Paul Tudor Jones, Louis Bacon, David Harding. Nobody has unlimited capital. You have to have a certain set of rules that says, I'm going to preserve capital until the market goes my way. So yeah, you, you, the market could go the very opposite direction once you cut your loss. Deal with it. The price will rise in the future. I just need to hold it until then. Well, yeah, the price might, is probably going to rise, at least in stocks at some point in time in the future. That's how it typically works. The question you have to have for yourself is when? Tomorrow? A month from now? A year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, when? When? How do you have a, an approach for when? So if, uh, if, if the other thing too, the opportunity cost, if all of your money is stuck in the markets and you're waiting for, uh, you're waiting for the win to happen, you can't very well deal with opportunity cost, can you? If you are in XYZ positions, multiple markets, and you can't take a loss and you're going to sit there because you know it's all going to come back, 
What the other opportunity comes along, you can't jump into the other opportunity if you're stuck with what you already have. As long as I don't sell, I don't lose money. Then why worry? It's no big deal. Shouldn't it, shouldn't it really affect you? Who cares? But, come on. If you're in a position, if you've got a trade on, and you're losing, and you're losing big, it's going to affect you. Of course it's going to affect you. How's it going to affect you? Emotionally? Psychologically? Opportunity costs? So, you know, you could, you, can, you could pretend as long as I don't sell, I don't lose money. But if you've got $100 in some position or a million dollars in some position, and that position is now worth half, either $50 or $500,000, and you keep saying to yourself, well, I haven't sold yet, so I haven't really incurred those losses. Well, you can keep up with that fantasy. You can stick with that notion or you can get the blank out. Look, cutting losses as, as a trader, that's, that's it. It's mission critical. One of the most difficult things to do. And as I've mentioned, whether it's relationships or trading, extremely difficult to do. You know, people love, they say, well, why, why, why cut my losses? I'll just throw some, you know, it's the, the whole notion. They throw good money after bad, right? Good money after bad. It just doesn't work. Look, this is the foundation of good trend following trading. Having a system that forces you to take losses when you have them is the, found, is the foundation of trend following trading. If you are unwilling to take your losses, then you know, you're probably, it's, it's red pill, blue pill time. You know, just don't listen to what I have to say. Go back to happy land. The system will take care of you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A quick break to remind listeners out there. If you have not yet read, and this is your assignment, if you have not yet read Trend Following, the Complete Turtle Trader, Trend Commandments, and the Little Book of Trading, along with watching my film, Broke the New American Dream, there is no better place to start your trend following foundation. If you'd like more information, or if you'd like to order any of my books or my film, go to trendfollowing.com. Let's jump right back into the podcast. So anyways, I want to try and end each segment with a couple things that I've seen in the news uh, recently. And can I just offer some quick opinions? John Hussman writes very bearish fundamental uh, projections, runs a fund. And he had a great uh, mathematically inclined analysis, uh, essentially about what's going on with the Fed right now and interest rates, uh, titled Eating the Future. And he kind of makes the math case for what has happened is that we have brought rates down to bring consumption in the future to today. And all we're really doing is perhaps increasing returns today, but forsaking larger returns in the future. So if you bring returns from the future forward to today, if you, if you, if you force people and you induce people to make riskier bets and apply more and more capital to markets when they would otherwise not do it, all you're doing is lowering the investment, the return horizon uh, for that whatever period we're talking, 10 years, whatnot. It's, a, it's an interesting piece. I just want to make, look, I have a difference of opinion with uh, John Husband on strategy, but from a big picture standpoint, when somebody is correctly analyzing what's going on in the broader society. This is why something like trend following is fantastic. Because if this is really taking place, if, if we are bringing returns from the future home today through these Fed machinations, if this is what is going on, 
and I believe it is. And you have no way to predict the timing of when, when it will all break down. You know it will be a black swan. You know it will be something that you can't predict. Well, what strategy puts you in a place to position if the system is being rigged, if the system is being ginned up, if the system is being manipulated, which I think it is, but I can't predict the timing of anything. What strategy puts you in a, a position to benefit when that happens? Trend volume. Plain and simple. One other point that I want to end on is something that I found really, uh, I don't want to use words like sad or anything like that because this is just typical. But it was a Bloomberg piece and it was a, a, a manager of the Japanese Teachers Fund. And I commented on my blog is it was kind of like happy talk. And, and the guy said, quote, we need to have a certain level of return no matter how the market condition is. And he was talking about diversifying into hedge funds, but he wasn't even talking about the style of hedge fund. He was just saying diversify into hedge funds. Look, if you are trying to make a consistent level of return all of the time, if that's what you want, if that's what you have to have, and that's what these pension funds have promised their people. And when you hear all these complaints in America about pension funds, whether it's the NFL referees right now or whether it's the Chicago Teachers Union. What no one's talking about is the promises that have been made to these people, promises made to all these folks, can't be paid. There is no way to pay it. And so when you see the, you know, when you're when you're seeing the NFL games decided by uh, strike busting uh, or union busting referees, uh, who aren't doing a very good job, uh, or you see the Chicago teachers going on strike, they're doing this because they know the promises that have been made to them can't be paid, but they don't care. And I guess that's their right not to care. But the entire system is predicated on a specific level of return. And so, and then once again, so whether it's the NFL referees, Chicago teachers, or the Japanese teachers, once again, what was this quote? We need to have a certain level of return no matter how the market condition is. Look, trying to make that consistent level of return is impossible. The markets don't have to cooperate with your vision of consistency, and they typically don't. The goal is to make the most money possible over time, knowing full well you're probably going to need an all-terrain vehicle for the bumps. See, these pension funds have been put together almost like uh, they're all Porsches riding on a smooth sailing road where there's never a problem, the economy always grows, and we can just keep expanding, 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 and everybody will have these great benefits. Actually, it's not everybody. It's typically, and I'm not making a political statement here, but it's typically the only people that really have pensions anymore in America, and maybe even around the world, are government employees. I don't think most private sector employees are fully cognizant yet of the fact that the only people left with pensions, and when I say a pension, you know, most people out there want to learn trend following, perhaps maybe to increase their retirement nest egg. When I say pension, a good many government employees will actually get, when they retire, and a lot of them retire in their 50s, will actually get like maybe 75% of their salary every month. We're not even talking about investment returns. We're talking they just literally get paid like they're still working, but at a reduced rate. I don't even think most people grasp that notion. But whether they grasp it or not, the issue is the money to pay these benefits, to pay these promises doesn't exist. So what you're seeing now is you're seeing these pension fund managers, the people that have to produce this return to pay all these promises, realizing they've got trouble. So when does the breaking point happen? I don't know when the breaking point happens. I just know it's mathematically impossible to pay all these benefits. But the larger issue, the larger issue from a trend following perspective is you can look at that whole world. I'm not really trying, to, I'm not trying to make a huge political statement. You can look at that whole world and you can say, well, from a trend following perspective, I know the world is not consistent. I know my returns, the gains that I'm going to uh, achieve over my lifetime are going to be lumpy. They're going to be irregular. It's going to be feast or famine. You know, it's not going to be, uh, 
trend following trader uh, uh, Mark Rosenberg years ago when I first met him, he was telling me, you know, at the time his office in Stanford, Connecticut, and he was he was doing quite well. And I know he's done quite well over a career, but he talked about early on. He knew he he would he would somehow sometimes come home and tell the wife, "Okay, it's back to pork and beans time." You know, he knew he knew it could go up and down. These folks over here, at the NFL refs and the teachers, they seemingly don't want to admit that things can go up or down. And I guess you know that's their right. They were made promises that they were going to get goodies for the rest of their life, but it just doesn't work that way. Life's not consistent. The markets are consistent. People are consistent. Growth is not consistent. Consistency is kind of a bad word. Consistency is really, uh, it's almost the mark of a loser if you think everything is so consistent. If you've, if you've convinced yourself that the world is just this nice, clean, neat, and you don't have the ability to adjust or adapt when something goes wrong. I, and I'll, I'll leave you with this, and I, I mentioned it on Facebook the other day, but I gave a presentation in Vancouver uh, in July. And probably the lar- – well, no, I actually gave a presentation, and I have to give shouts out to Christian Baja, who's the CEO of Superfund, who allowed me to speak at a, an event that he had at the Hofburg Palace in Vienna, Austria, a few years back. And uh, it was about an audience of 1,600 uh German-speaking Austrians, uh, all wearing translation headphones. So that was probably the largest group that I've ever uh, presented in front of. It was very brief, but it was still really interesting, especially a hell of an environment, the Hofburg Palace. It was drop-dead gorgeous. But so I gave this presentation at the uh, Fairmont Hotel in Vancouver in July for Agora. And I think they said it was going to be either 40 or 45 minutes. And as I was walking on stage, uh, they said 35 minutes. Now, it's not really a huge difference, but it's like you lock your mind in certain time frames and like all of a sudden you're like, okay. And you don't, you know, you're walking out in front of a thousand people, okay? Like as you're, you're telling you no 40 or 45, 35 and as you're walking out there. So you can't like frown or anything. You just, you have to adjust. You have to adjust so damn quick that nobody sees that you ever saw there was ever a problem. I mean, that's how it goes. Boom, boom. And so that was the small problem for that presentation, actually. Now, this was going to be something where there was going to be a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm intimately familiar with the material. Uh, I don't read from a teleprompter, but I had, just for extra effect on my PowerPoint presentation, I had some notes embedded that uh, just like some extra bullet points where I could just kind of, you know, give a, 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 a some some extra razzle-dazzle, whatever. And look, I don't know about anybody else out there, but after 10 plus years of staring at monitors, uh, my eyes in terms of reading are just toast. So as I walk around with my $30 CVS reading glasses, uh, how pathetic, um, I guess I should, uh, I don't know if, I don't know if this LASIK stuff can fix my eyes or not. But, um, so as I walk out there, um, there's a, there's a little monitor set next to the stand. Now I'm walking out there. I have to start talking. They've just told me it's, uh, it's no longer 40 or 45. It's 35. I'm walking out there in front of a thousand people. I know that I want to start with something and I assumed I'd be able to see the bullet points that I'd already prepared. And I look down and even throwing the reading glasses on nonchalantly at a very quick pace, this monitor they had right to the side of me w- was not legible, at least for not for my eyes, was not legible. So not only is the timing messed up as I'm walking out, I now realize I can't read any of the bullets at that moment in time. And so you essentially then make up 35 minutes on the fly. But look, there was a good round of applause. A thousand people seemed to enjoy it. The next day, there was an overflow presentation where I spoke for about over over an hour in front of another 300 people. Um, and everyone seemed to enjoy it. And, you know, it's funny about those kinds of things. You just have to adjust on the fly. And I, I sometimes think, I'm never nervous about these things, but you 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 just have to take the energy of the situation. And you have to go with it. And you say, you say, you almost have to say, I'm lucky. I'm lucky. I'm alive. Somebody is giving me a stage. There's a thousand people out there. They want to hear me say something coherent that they can perhaps use to make money. And 
you go with it. You go with it. You know, so even, even if I just hearken back to my beginning of this presentation, the stop loss aspect, you guys kind of roll the punches. You know, the loss for me was, okay, they've changed the time. Oop, that's a loss. You know, oops, they, I can't read, I can't see those bullets. Oop, that's a loss. But you just move on. You accept it and move on. Moment of now, move on. I hope in this presentation today, you at least walk away with this feeling of understanding sunk cost, understanding opportunity cost, thinking about the notion of uh, your stop loss, accepting a loss, taking a loss. In, in, in this consistency thing, all this consistency and these, these pension funds and all this stuff, that's all going to break. So don't count on that. That will break at some point in time of your lifetime. So don't count on that. It's only you. Personal responsibility 101. That's all you got. That's all you can do. You're the only person you can rely on. Till next time. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.